everyone. I'm Janet Salmons, Research Community Manager for Sage Method Space, and I'm delighted today to be joined by Herman Aginnis and Ravi Ramani. And we are going to talk about methodological reviews. But first, if you are new to Method Space, um, this is a blog community hosted by Sage Publishing. We're interested in everything to do with designing, planning, analyzing research, writing about it, sharing results in all different kinds of ways. And you can see at the heart of this diagram, we have teaching and learning because we think that whether you are a brand new researcher or an experienced researcher, we all have something to learn. And that's why I enjoy doing these interviews and having an opportunity to meet with a variety of researchers from around the world. So we're focusing on methods based on a feature topic about impactful literature reviews. And so one of uh, the articles in that collection is uh, this one, Best Practice Recommendations for Producers, Evaluators, and Users of Methodological Reviews, which we are going to discuss. Um, but first, let me introduce our um, panel today. Um, Herman Aginnis is the Avram Tucker Distinguished scholar and professor of management at the George Washington University School of Business. And he served as president of the Academy of Management in 2021 and 2022. His research is interdisciplinary and addresses the global acquisition and deployment of talent in organizations and organizational research methods. Every year since 2018, the Web of Science highly cited researchers reports has ranked him among the world's 100 most impactful researchers in economics and business. And he has been inducted into the PhD Project Hall of Fame. Professor Guinness has published 11 books and more than 200 refereed journal articles and delivered more than 30 keynotes and about 170 invited presentations in all seven continents except for Antarctica and I'm sure they'll be um, thinking about inviting you after hearing this interview. Um, Ravi Rumani is an pr assistant professor of organizational behavior and human resource management in the business administration department of the Earl Graves School of Business and Management at Morgan State University in Maryland. His research interests include career development, progression and outcomes, management education and scholarly impact and organizational research methods. His work has been published in the Academy of Management Annals, Academy of Management Learning and Education, Academy of Management Perspectives, Journal of International Business Studies, Journal of International, um, oops, I've got that twice, um, Journal of Knowledge Management, Journal of Management Organizational, and research methods and elsewhere. So um, you bring a lot of experience to this work and I think is a very uh, useful article for our audience. So I, I want to start with uh, one of the points that you made. Uh, you mentioned in the article, the importance of identifying and minimizing questionable research practices and the exploitation of methodological gray areas um, using the acronym QPRs. So could you define what you mean by questionable research practice practices and how would a researcher know they are in a gray area? Right. Thank you, Janet. Uh, thank you for also for having us here. And that's a great question because that was one of the motivations behind this paper is this idea of QRPs. And uh, QRPs or questionable research practices, they're basically any methodological practice related to design, data collection, analysis, or reporting that is in this kind of gray area or what we call the gray zone between best practice and clearly wrong, right? So they, could, they are often used by researchers to selectively bolster their argument. So for example, uh, a researcher might be looking at the data and eliminate particular outliers one by one until the hypothesis is supported. And then post hoc, then they come up with the reason for why they eliminated those particular outliers and not others. And again, this is kind of in that gray zone. 
So if you want to kind of understand whether or not what you're doing is in that gray zone, whether it's a QRP or potentially a QRP, I think you can ask yourself, start by asking yourself two questions. One, it's related to transparency. So you can think about it and say, well, if every aspect of my project was exposed to public scrutiny, everything that I've done in this paper was exposed to public scrutiny, would I be comfortable with that? Mm -hmm. The other question you can ask yourself is, can I clearly identify that what I'm doing methodologically mm -hmm. is in line with best practice recommendations that we know now? And what we would suggest is that if you feel that the answer to either one of those questions is no, then you're in that gray area where you may be, maybe unwittingly, engaging in questionable mm -hmm. research practices. And that's where you kind of take time to stop and take stock and kind of see what else you need to do. Mm -hmm. Right. I think a really, really important points for people to think about that, you know, sometimes it, sort of the idea of research ethics um, mm -hmm. doesn't extend to thinking about the decisions that you make in, in the process, as you've described. It's really an uh, interesting way of thinking about it. Um, you noted that Few methodological literature reviews utilize data integration approaches such as meta-analytic or umbrella reviews. Do you think this kind of review is, um, is not being conducted or you know, how could such reviews benefit the field? Ravi, I'm gonna let you take this one as well. Go ahead. <laughs> okay, thanks everyone. Um, <laughs> so, you know, uh, I think meta-analytic and umbrella reviews are, they have immense potential for our field. Uh, so meta-analytic review, just to kind of give background, it's what we think of as a regular meta-analysis, right? So they're, we're quantitative, we're aggregating data and synthesizing mm -hmm. quantitative data across multiple studies that focus on a particular, in this case, mm -hmm. methodological issue from primary and secondary data studies. Um, the goal here is to identify variability about that practice mm -hmm. and identify which method might, or which approach might be best in different contexts. Mm -hmm. An umbrella review, in contrast, is a review of reviews. So this is looking at previous reviews only that have been done and saying, what are similarities? What are potential contradictions? How do we resolve them? And identify, mm -hmm. identifying the one best way. Mm -hmm. So if you think about them kindly, the meta-analytic review is really useful when you have you know, what, we, what I kind of think of as the horses for courses approach, right? It's the same issue, but in a different context, a researcher might, mm -hmm. the best practice might be to use one way, and in a different context, there's a different way. An umbrella review is one size fits all, right? This is the best way based on everything we know mm -hmm. now, and this is what you should do. In our review, we found that these are relatively underutilized, and I think one of the reasons is because we're still a pretty young field. So if you think mm -hmm. about management research in general, we're comparatively new. I mean, ORM itself, like our premier journal, just turns 25 this year. I was just looking at when it founded in, in 1998. So a lot of our methodologies are still evolving. Mm -hmm. Our paradigms are still relatively weak. They're solidifying. So I think, uh, I believe and hope that as these, as our methodologies evolve, as our science gets stronger, we'll see more of more of these because we'll have this broad base of evidence that these reviews require mm -hmm. to really be successfully conducted. So, so it, I think building on your previous point about the questionable research practices, this kind of really in-depth methodological review could, could help a relatively new researcher or someone who's maybe thinking about taking a different approach than they've done before to, to look at you know, what, what the successful, respected research has, um, has, has used as an approach and be able to maybe, maybe it would help them to identify some of those gray areas and how to proceed. Yeah, absolutely. So for example, for a meta-analytic review, uh, one of the ones we cite is about response rates in organizational mm -hmm. research. And we know response rates are affected by context and who your samples are. So a met, there is actually a meta-analytic review by NCL et al that talks about this. So that can be very useful if you're a doctoral student trying to write out your for your committee, right, to justify this is the response rate I ex mm -hmm. expect, and this is kind of in line with mm -hmm. what data suggests and what research suggests is good. And then we have another one, not to toot our own horn, <laughs> that we cite uh, the umbrella review that 
uh, Herman and I co-authored with one of our colleagues uh, about methodological transparency, right? How clearly are decisions reported mm -hmm. in uh, management research? And we looked at, yeah, now I'm blanking on how many different reviews we looked at, mm -hmm. but there's a lot of different reviews mm -hmm. and we synthesized that. So we, in this case, we're really looking at that. And again, for a researcher who's starting out or even sometimes experienced researchers, right? Who are trying a new method mm -hmm. or maybe returning to a different area. Mm -hmm. uh, this can be helpful and say, well, this is today, this is where the science is and this is the best way to d discuss outliers or use control variables mm -hmm. or report, you know, use p-values or not use p-values. Mm -hmm. let, me, let me add to that, that we have new methods uh, that are being proposed all the time. In fact, we have entire journals devoted to new methods. Organizational research methods is one. Psychological methods is another one. The good news is that every time a new method is proposed, typically the authors have to provide evidence the method is actually trustworthy, that the mm -hmm. method works. Otherwise, the paper wouldn't be published. Mm -hmm. So our task as users of methods is to evaluate whether mm -hmm. each of those new methods may be useful and appropriate mm -hmm for our own purposes, for our own contexts. The way I think about methods is uh, methods are tools. So the, the tools are not good or bad in themselves. <laughs> they can mm -hmm. be used well, they can, be, they can be misused, or they can be abused. Mm -hmm. So, But the more the methods we know, the better our toolkit, mm -hmm. and the larger the options we have as researchers in terms of conducting empirical research. So let me just mention one other point. I don't think that any important or grand challenge kind of question can be answered by using only one method. Mm -hmm. Important questions need to be answered by doing multiple studies and using mm -hmm. multiple methods. If you see that you're getting the same result and you can draw the same conclusion across studies using very different methods, that's when you start to believe that mm -hmm. you truly have a result that is mm -hmm. robust that is trustworthy, replicable, mm -hmm. and that you can use it to uh, implement practices and policies as well. Right. Well, really um, excellent points that I think will be um, uh, useful to our readers and, and help them to you know, see the value of what you've written about in this article. So uh, another uh, statement from the article I'd like to dig into a little bit um, I, I agree with you that you know technological changes and the availability of different kinds of data uh, means that um, researchers need to expand their toolkits on an ongoing basis. Kind of as you said, the the, the more you understand, for one thing, the, the more kinds of literature you'll understand, as well as having different options um, for you know what you're going to research, but. You know, that said, you know, it seems to me that, you know, given the, you know, what we're talking about that, you know, the value of, of, of learning different kinds of approaches so that you can study something from a variety of perspectives, mm -hmm. um, that it, it seems like sometimes the, in journal articles, the explanations of the methods, the method sections are, are not, you know, really adequate. So uh, do you think that the need for skills development means journals should allow more space for more discussion of the methods used or should uh, reviewers ask writers to, you know, to explain more clearly what they've done? What, what do you think would, would be beneficial? Ravi, shall I take this one as well? Yes, please. <laughs> okay. So great question, Janet. And, um, uh, I'd like to read history. And if you think about uh, other scientific fields that are much older uh, than, than management or social sciences in general, the methods in those fields are, are quite standardized. Mm -hmm. um, so they don't need to use so much um, mm -hmm. journal space to explain what they did because everybody knows <laughs> what mm -hmm. they did. For example, let me think about one example, chemistry, for example, in chemistry, um, you just mentioned the method you used and the readers know, for example, let's say gravimetric analysis, that, that's a very standardized method that is used to determine the amount of water in a hydrate. And by, by heating it, and then you calculate the weight of the water that was lost. 
Mm -hmm. uh, another classic method used in, in chemistry uh, all the time is volumetric analysis, also known as titration. So if you're writing a paper in chemistry, you just say, I use titration. And mm -hmm. You don't have to write three papers, three pages uh, about mm -hmm. the method, because mm -hmm. like we do in our papers in management and the social sciences, in our fields, because our fields are much younger, methods are more idiosyncratic. Mm -hmm. For example, one of the most common methods used in social science research is the interview. Mm -hmm. All the interviews are different. <laughs> Every paper right. And also within papers, the interviews are different. Uh, for example, the questions may not be the same. The length of the interviews may not be the same. The interactions with the people mm -hmm. being interviewed may be different. Some may be warmer, some may be colder. So in our papers, we need to explain all the details for readers to understand mm -hmm. what we did, how we did it, and also for research to be able to replicate mm -hmm. the future. So. If I had a crystal ball and, and uh, you asked me to uh, to predict the future, I would say that in the future, as management and, and social science research becomes more mature, we will need less space in our journals to describe what we did because the procedures mm -hmm. will be much more standardized and known by everyone. Mm -hmm. But to you know, putting th this point together with the, the questionable research practice, uh, issue and you know wanting to be clear you know in in the articles that you write that you are using sound practices on um, the the ability to explain those clearly would seem like a, a, a an important uh, skill set to have and and also put some impetus for reviewers and editors to to give feedback to people around those those you know, parts of the study that, you know, don't just kind of breeze through that. We we need to know, how did you do this? Why did you choose to do it that way? Um, so your article um, offers recommendations for producers, evaluators, and users of methodological reviews, which suggests a broad need for improvement. So what benefits do you see in a best case scenario, you know, if your recommendations are adopted. So perhaps, you know, just mention a couple of those recommendations that, that you have for, um, you know, people who are, are both creating and using these kinds of reviews and, you know, how, how might those help to improve the state of the field? Um, so I think two parts. So well, at least what I think of it, right? Methodology can be challenging. It can sometimes even be daunting, right? So depending on mm -hmm. who you are and how long you've been in the field and what, you, what you're doing, what data pieces are you doing? Um, so our, you know, when you say our hope, our best kind of case mm -hmm. scenario, so we, we say producers, evaluators, users. So for producers, we're talking about folks who are writing reviews, who are looking mm -hmm. at methodological reviews. And because methodology can sometimes seem daunting, we perhaps a lot of people feel that they can't participate in this process. So our hope would be that as people read our review, they see that, well, this is a standardized process, right? It's not, mm -hmm. it's not necessarily paint by numbers, but there is a process that mm -hmm. you can use to produce these reviews. It's a systematic replicable process that you can use. And then if somebody has been using a particular method for a while, they've kind of gained some expertise in it, even if they don't think of themselves as a methodologist per se, mm -hmm. they might be, encouraged to write a review, right? I've seen this and like Herman said, we're reading reviews and we're, our papers and we're not sure if what they did is right. They, hey, I could maybe write this review. So I think that will be useful. That's our hope is that these mm -hmm. papers stimulate more methodological literature reviews, which are very important for our field to kind of disseminate mm -hmm. these best practices. Uh, for evaluators, right? We're talking about reviewers and editors and these folks mm -hmm. are probably, or not probably are likely, methodological experts already. So they already have deep knowledge about these particular practices. Mm -hmm. And for them, what we're hoping is that they'll use our recommendations and checklists uh, mm -hmm. to kind of evaluate the submissions they receive and provide feedback that will make the review itself more accessible mm -hmm. for substantive reviewer, researchers. Mm -hmm. So again, the experts themselves have all the knowledge they need, but that review needs to speak broadly to substantive review researchers who are maybe don't have that in-depth knowledge. So mm -hmm. how do we clearly communicate pieces mm -hmm. of information? How do we 
provide examples. So those are some of the things that we hope evaluators can use from our review. And also, you know, we've talked quite a bit about QRPs, but this idea that as the review was produced, was the review produced free of, or at least minimizing QRPs in the production? So evaluators, mm -hmm. we think, or we hope, would be able to use that piece. Um, and then finally, for users, I think that's our, you know, that's, so we talked a little bit about doctoral students, or even people who are teaching doctoral uh, students. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we, we look at literature and we're trying to teach, or as a doctoral student, you're trying to understand, what can you trust? You have to build up that idea. Right. Is this right. other results re reviewable? Are these trustworthy? Mm -hmm. Can I really, or should I really add this to my base of knowledge? Mm -hmm. So we're hoping that as they read these methodological mm -hmm. literature reviews, and you know, hopefully there are more of them, they're better co quality, mm -hmm. they're even more rigorous, they're more accessible. These folks can then start using these benchmarks and saying, well, is this knowledge trustworthy? How is this produced? Can mm -hmm. I trust these results? And then they become more discerning consumers of the information mm -hmm. that's coming out there. So uh, I think in terms of the examples, so we provide quite a few examples of different types of reviews. Um, and you know, I'll just give you a couple. So for example, there's uh, the one review that we that I'll talk about is the one that's most cited in our paper, which was Vandenberg and Lance. It's an older review uh, about measurement invariance. I think we think they did so many great things right, and we exemplify. And in our paper, we describe how they did what they did right. right? What are mm -hmm. the different pieces? How they give examples? How they walk them step by step? So, if you're a novice researcher just mm -hmm. being introduced to measurement invariance, that's a great place to learn about what that particular issue mm -hmm. is and how you might mm -hmm. start addressing it. Again, that's an older paper, so you definitely want to read more. But that's an example of what a great review can look like. We also, uh, I talked about ANSEAL et al. We talked about response rates. Uh, there's a great paper by Bernard et al. about outliers, uh, controls. There's different papers on control variables. So again, these examples, and they are in our paper it's per se, uh, can really help people understand what different review types look like and how good, what substantiates good reviews that are easily mm -hmm. accessible and informative. Is there anything else you would like to add uh, that might benefit our method space readers who um, are probably fit all all of those uh, categories of uh, <laughs> sure let, let me let me just add a, let me add a couple of points. In January of 2023, I had the the privilege and the opportunity to go to the to Egypt to Cairo and participate in the Africa Academy of Management. And of course, I toured the pyramids and I was mm -hmm. able to learn about the ma amazing astronomy that was going on in Egypt um, in the year 2600 BC. <laughs> but of course, they didn't get things right because they were looking at the stars and they were looking at the sky with their naked eye. And the major discoveries in astronomy happened because of new and better methods. Mm -hmm. The telescope, thanks to the telescope, we were able to understand how big and old the universe is. And we were able to see that there are stars, there are planets, constellations, and different things. So we're able to see things more clearly. But of course, when the uh, Hubble telescope was launched and then the Webb uh, telescope was mm -hmm. launched, the notions of how big and how old the universe is changed completely. Right. Uh, so new, new, new methods really... Uh, created a revolution in astronomy. And the same thing happened in biology. Think about biology before the uh, microscope. <laughs> we didn't know mm -hmm. about viruses, right. bacteria, germs, nothing. In the Middle Ages, if you were ill, they would bleed you because they thought they would take the evil spirits out of your body because they didn't know you, you had an infection. So I think that our methods uh, will continue to produce and help us produce important discoveries. Our methods are our tools. If we know our tools, we can test theories. We can develop new theories. Mm -hmm. And knowing our tools is absolutely essential for us to learn the craft of doing research. So we need to know our tools. Like plumbers know their tools. If a mm -hmm. plumber knows their tools, they can install a new sink even if the model mm -hmm. of the new sink is very complicated and very unique, they have their tools, they know how to use them. So I would say the same applies to us as researchers. 
if we know our research methods, that is, we know our mm -hmm. tools, we can work on many different theories, no matter how new or complex the theory may be. To learn the craft of research, we need to learn how to use our tools. So thank you so much, Janet, for Method Space, which creates such incredible opportunity and resources for all of us to learn new methods and improve our toolkit. Right. Well, thank you for, uh, for joining and for uh, sharing this really valuable and thought-provoking uh, article. And I think it will be um, very uh, interesting to <laughs> you know variety of, of readers and, and and helping to both um, you know ground in respected tried and true methods but also as you say to you know be open to, to new approaches that can really help us to develop the knowledge that we need. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you.